I imagine some people wonder, Penniless, how do you manage to stay as a free-to-play user in Hearthstone? And it's actually fairly simple. All you have to do is avoid impulsively buying card packs. As you can see here, I have a large amount of gold because I'm saving up for the next expansion. But every once in a while I'll buy myself a pack just to sate the itch. Here, I'll go to the store, buy one for 100 gold, and then go to the pack section, open it up, and... Okay, that wasn't very lucky. Oh well, we'll just go back to the store, buy another one for 100 gold, go back to the pack section, open it up, and... Alright, you know what? Third time's a charm. So let's try this one more time. Go to the store, 100 gold, buy the pack, go to the pack section, open it up, and... Yes! That's more like it. No need to keep opening these things, I am satisfied. And maybe just one more. Greetings and welcome to Hearthstone Theory. Today I'll be taking the topics covered on this show in a new direction, and focus on something different than the gameplay of Hearthstone. Instead we'll be concentrating on an aspect of the game separate from the card combinations and deck construction, but still one very important to discuss. Card packs and their value. Hearthstone has multiple sets of cards, the expansions that rotate out on a bi-yearly basis, the basic set that most people quickly earn, and the classic set that's been around since the game's beginning. There's also the Hall of Fame, but that's basically just an offshoot of the classic set. But what isn't immediately apparent about all these different sets of cards and these different packs is that Blizzard has employed a very interesting strategy when it comes to selling them. And this strategy is more sophisticated than just in-game currency, therefore profit. The dust system, the rotating sets, free packs through tavern brawls and special events, all of it is designed to maximize Blizzard's bottom line. Today, I will be examining precisely that strategy, why it operates in this manner, and how you as a player can best employ tactics for it. This theory will answer three questions. The value of dust, the value of card packs, and how different card sets compare. Leave your questions and concerns in the comments section, and as always, ring a like and leave a subscribe. That's what us YouTubers say, right? I didn't mess it up? Anyways, let's begin. Hearthstone has two in-game currencies, gold and arcane dust. Gold is used to purchase packs, arena tickets, and brawlicium tickets, while dust is used to craft individual cards. Comparing and contrasting these two different currencies is going to get complicated quickly, so let's start off by getting a ratio between the two currencies. How much dust is 100 gold worth? If you apply any amounts of critical thought to this problem whatsoever, this ratio is… hilariously obvious. 100 gold is worth 100 dust, for a ratio of 1 to 1. The two main pieces of evidence I'll present are as follows. First, arena awards use gold and dust interchangeably. You're just as likely to get 50 dust from an arena pack as 50 gold, which means that on a certain level it's designed to be equivalent. Second, the Taverns of Time rewarded players with quests that gave both dust and gold in equal amounts, which compares nicely to the Fire Festival's double gold rewards. Again, it's not direct evidence that these two are equal in worth, but it definitely implies that to be the case. But the thing is, we need to take this 1 to 1 ratio on faith, because a direct conversion from gold to dust is impossible in the game. The most direct conversion method that Hearthstone has is simple, buying Hearthstone packs and turning the cards into dust. This is where things get interesting, because the value of a Hearthstone pack is often quite variable, by nature of it being a card pack. Let's start by looking at the rarities of individual cards and how they show up in packs. Hearthstone cards can be turned into different amounts of dust depending on their rarity. 5 dust for common cards, 20 for rare cards, 100 for epic, and 400 for legendary. Plus, different rates for golden versions of these cards. We can refer to this all as a card's minimum value. That will be relevant later. So the minimum value of a Hearthstone pack comes out to 40 dust, 4 common cards of 5 dust each, and a rare of 20 dust. For a price of 100 gold, this seems like a bit of a ripoff. However, we do not care about individual packs, we care about the statistics of many packs. So we should now answer the question, how much dust is a pack worth statistically accounting for these less common openings? This question is actually somewhat more complicated than you'd first expect. I'll start by explaining the easy part. On average, every 5 Hearthstone packs contains an Epic card, and every 20 Hearthstone packs contains a Legendary, so we can look at the average dust we obtain from buying 20 packs. 
You'd think that'd be easy. 40 dust times 20 packs, plus 400 dust from the epics, and another 400 dust from the legendaries, for a grand total of 1600 dust for 20 packs. Alas, no. First, we have the fact that each epic and legendary card gets rid of a common or rare card. Okay, that's simple enough. But then we have packs that end up giving you an extra rare card, which makes for a net profit of another 15 dust minimum. Okay... But then there are the ridiculously extravagant packs that have multiple legendaries and epics. Also kinda confusing. Then pity timers make it such that you're guaranteed a legendary every 40 packs, and an epic every 10, which prevents the lowest statistical options and therefore ups the average. Clearly this is starting to be a headache. And finally, golden cards are just the cherry on top of all of this. Fortunately, I am not the first person to try looking at this. Many Hearthstone players record their card pack openings, and others still have performed proper statistical analyses. The Hearthstone wiki is kind enough to put many of these studies into tables, and in this data are some interesting gems. For example, you're about four times as likely to get a normal legendary card as a golden epic. And epic cards are more common than all golden cards combined. Keep that in mind when you're destroying those golden cards that you've stockpiled. Anyways, with these statistics, we can calculate the average dust value of these packs, assuming all cards are converted to dust immediately after opening. With that, we get to a grand total of... 102.71 arcane dust per pack. Okay, I'll be honest, I'm a little surprised here. I didn't expect this number to be above 100. However, in hindsight, it actually makes a decent amount of sense. While gold substitutes for actual money, there's no way to turn gold into real-life currency. At the same time, there's no way to turn arcane dust into gold. So converting gold into dust should net you more dust than gold because you can do more with the gold than you can do with dust, including create dust. If anything, this just means that getting dust in an arena award is actually Blizzard ripping you off. However, here's the thing, we're not done yet. That analysis was nice, but all we calculated with that was the minimum value of these card packs, not their actual value. Penniless? What's the difference? Isn't it just worth the dust anyways? Oh, hypothetical viewer, the answer to that is no. Remember, we're spending this gold and this dust to get cards, so the question isn't the minimum amount of dust it's worth, it's the impact the pack has on our collection. Let's consider a player that hasn't gotten any Boomsday cards and decides to buy some Boomsday packs. Every card they open is one that they wouldn't have in their collection. A card like Giggling Inventor isn't going to get turned into 20 dust, it'll be saved to prevent you from spending 100 dust on it. So the first two openings of that card are, in actuality, worth 100 dust. This doesn't hold true for all cards. A card like Astral Rift will likely never be worth playing in Constructed, for example. Although it is worth considering that new players have to just make do with what cards they can find, but I digress. Point being, if you open a card that you don't own and you'd be willing to use it, that is a remarkable economic benefit. Once again, this makes perfect sense. Blizzard is incentivized to get players to buy packs as they come out new, since it keeps the game flowing. Making it such that the first several packs you get are worth more in terms of dust starts the flow of this economy, encouraging players to buy at least a few packs. It's also inclusive to getting new players to join, and makes for more incentive to partake in newer expansions. Sound logic all around. But now we get to the crux of this pack buying analysis. Which packs should be bought? And it's at this point where Blizzard puts aside its tactical generosity, and instead concentrates on getting the most out of its resources. For you see, all sets are equal, but no two sets are alike. First and foremost, each of these sets has its base value decreased by one important factor, how long it's in the standard set. Being able to use cards in the standard set naturally makes them more useful. More use, more useful, it's in the grammar. So while the Angoro and Witchwood sets have a full two years in circulation, the Boomsday, Frozen Throne, and Cobalt sets have less time. The Cobalt and Catacomb set in particular only has a year and a few months. Same goes for the next set coming later this year. A short-sighted player may assume that means the Witchwood set is a good investment, since it'll last longer. However, it's not that simple. Blizzard is well aware of the shelf life of its different sets, and have taken adjustments accordingly. Have you noticed that the Mean Streets and Cobalt sets, both sets that happened towards the end of the year, were the sets that had the most powerful cards? Patches, Raza, Jade Golems, Kingsbane, Carnivorous Cube? This isn't an oversight by Blizzard, this is intended design. Because these packs are in circulation for a smaller amount of time, 
having them on the same power level as the other packs doesn't make sense. So to keep each set viable economically, Blizzard makes the later sets stronger. It's subtle, naturally, but these later sets will oftentimes have more valuable pieces than the sets before them. Sure, each set has some powerful cards and some garbage cards, but the ratio of what's strong versus what's weak goes up as the year progresses. The average Angoro card is weaker than the average Cobalt card, and more importantly for us, the average Witchwood card will be weaker than the average card from the upcoming set later this year. Hearthstone Mathematics, a channel I adore and would love to work with in the future, has already done a statistical analysis of the different set's relevance, at least for the Boomsday meta. Link in the description. And their findings line up with my claims. The Witchwood and Angoro sets comprise 8% and 9% of the meta respectively, while Cobalt and Catacombs is closer to 20% popularity. Likewise, the sets that came out in the middle of their respective years are in the middle when it comes to power level. This trend explains some of the gripes that players have when the new Hearthstone year begins, like when Old Gods, Karazhan, and Mean Streets rotated out, while Witchwood rotated in. With the exception of Odd and Even decks, much of the top tier in the early Witchwood meta resembled what came before, with Cubelock and Spiteful Druid being the prime examples. Sure, these decks were later nerfed, but regardless. The later sets are the ones that are most likely to have stronger cards, thus increasing the value of purchasing them. So altogether, the balance of saving gold and buying different card packs is pretty well kept. Weaker card sets last for longer, while stronger ones last less long. With this in mind, you may wonder what the best tactics are for a consumer like yourself. To aid with that smart spending, here is the Paleos Player's Guide to Buying Hearthstone Packs. First and foremost, when in doubt, buy Classic Packs. The Classic set is the largest set in the game, and also has had many of its cards remain in the meta as time goes on. Couple that with it receiving the most card nerfs, and the fact that it will always be in standard, and this set is clearly a cut above the rest. Unless you are lacking in cards from a particular expansion, the Classic set should always be your default purchase. Second, buy most of your packs right at the start of the expansion. The very start of an expansion is when the card packs have the most value, since no nerfs have taken place on the cards yet. Therefore, maximizing your spending at this time reaps you the greatest results. Additionally, this maximizes the time you have with your new cards, which makes the purchase even more fiscally sound. Third, buy 50 to 100 packs each expansion. Since, as we mentioned, all expansions are roughly equal in terms of value, there's no need to treat them differently when it comes to spending. You may get stronger cards with Cobalts, but you also get less time to use them. So buy about the same number of packs per expansion, at minimum around 50 and at most around 100. It's at about the 50 pack point where you'll have a significant majority of the common and rares of a set, as well as a handful of epics and legendaries. While you may want to keep fishing for that rare legendary that you want, it would be wiser to save that wealth for the next expansion, or to invest it in your classic packs. If you're willing to spend more and already have most of the classic set, you can of course purchase more of these packs. Just remember that the later packs will be less valuable than the earlier ones, and thus it would be wise to buy approximately the same amount from each set. Fourth, don't craft cards until you are done opening packs. Once a card is in your collection, the value you get from opening a new copy diminishes. And once a strong legendary is in your collection, since you can't open duplicate legendaries, the odds that your packs will give you a weak legendary increase. To minimize the odds of this happening, buy the packs that you want, and then stop. Buy your Witchwood packs, craft Baku again, then start saving for Boomsday. Finally, don't make dust unless you're crafting another card right then. It's better to have an excess of cards, even golden cards, than it is to have a stockpile of dust. The card's dust value will never decrease while it is in its card form, but it may increase if it gets nerfed. This is thanks to that rule that you get full disenchant value when a card is nerfed. So don't disenchant cards even if you think they're useless, unless you're about to spend that dust somewhere else. The only time you should consider pushing the disenchant extra cards button is if it gives you the exact amount of dust you need, and even then you may want to consider dusting different cards manually. While you can save gold for future card packs, cards have the same spending power as dust, so have a stockpile of cards rather than a stockpile of their leftovers. I want to commend Blizzard for this setup of card packs. When it comes to filling your collection, packs have their pros and cons, 
but most seem to offer equivalent benefits. While the minutia of maximizing the value of these packs can be somewhat complicated, the resulting strategy makes for a healthy game. Buy enough packs from each set, then save up for the next one. This approach is definitely what I consider constructive to a game that I want to last for a long time.